Welcome to the future and you. This episode is for February 18, 2009. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Kim Stanley Robinson. Kim Stanley Robinson will be guest of honor next year at the 2010 World Science Fiction Convention in Melbourne, Australia. And he'll be one of the teachers this year at the Clarion Workshop in 2009. He is a best-selling and award-winning science fiction author who may be best known for his Mars trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. Other novels include 50 Degrees Below, 40 Signs of Rain, The Years of Rice and Salt, and most recently, 60 Days and Counting. In today's interview, Kim Stanley Robinson describes his excitement about being guest of honor next year at the World Science Fiction Convention in Melbourne, Australia. He also describes benefits and challenges of the personal appearance he did recently in Second Life. He explains his disbelief that we will ever develop artificial intelligence, the singularity, mind uploading, or human immortality. But he also describes his enthusiastic agreement with the desirability of increasing human longevity as much as possible, even if that means centuries, and even if it throws a monkey wrench into population control. He equates increased longevity with decreasing human suffering. However, he doubts that what some people call longevity liftoff will come soon enough for anyone alive today. About population, he says, our current population may be the result of an oil bubble, and that the world's population may not be sustainable at its current levels after we run out of oil. He also explains why people will be disappointed concerning the relationship they have with their robots in the future. He expects them to watch their machine for some glimmer of intelligence and of personality, but will not find it. He also talks about his involvement with the Clarion Workshop, how he will teach there this summer, about his teaching there once before in 1988, about being a student there in 1975, about the methods used at Clarion, and about how he helped Clarion to find a new home at his alma mater when it had to move. Kim Stanley Robinson's writings have won the Hugo, the Nebula, the Asimov, the John W. Campbell, the Locus, and the World Fantasy Awards. He has a bachelor's degree in literature, a master's in English, and a PhD also in English. He considers science fiction to be one of the most powerful of all literary forms, which explains why his doctoral thesis was titled The Novels of Philip K. Dick. And now, on to our interview. Here is Kim Stanley Robinson. First of all, congratulations. I understand that next year, in 2010, you will be the guest of honor at the 68th World Science Fiction Convention in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Yes, that was a thrill. How long have you known? Well, it was a little before the um, Denver convention. The Australians uh, who were putting together their bid contacted me and asked me if I would um, if I would agree to be guest of honor. And of course, that's a major lifetime career honor for any science fiction writer. So it's not exactly a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, I was really thrilled, and I had my fingers crossed for them. And as I understood it, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, competition for the the bid for the home Worldcon space for that year, so I had uh, I had high hopes, and and then after the Denver convention, then I knew it was going to be true. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Yeah, it was great, and it, and as I say, I'm thrilled. It's a it's a real honor for any science fiction writer. It, uh, you know, it's it really as since the days of of uh, Heinlein and Asimov, it, it basically is something that's only going to happen once, if it happens at all. And um, I had been to Australia twice in um, science fiction tours and went to their national convention uh, in Tasmania in the early 90s. And they are a very, it's like science fiction communities all over the world. It's a really um, um, cohesive community of n nice people, hardworking, and uh, they have a lot of fun at their national convention, and and I, I visited them in Melbourne and Sydney and and at Canberra, and so I I actually saw a fair bit of Australia, considering that it was just a book tour, um, partly because of the kindness of local science fiction fans or science fiction writers who were taking me out and showing me the cities that they that I was in. 
so it was a good it was a good uh, a pair of trips um, and I'm a little vague on the dates but something like maybe 90 96 and 98 something like that yeah, everybody that I've talked to that that's been to Australia, they just they rave about how beautiful it is and how how kind the people are, friendly. Yeah, that's a very friendly uh, culture, and um, the beauty of it is is weird. I think actually it it reminds me a lot of Southern California where I grew up. Um, it looks like Southern California looked back in the 1950s and 60s, mm-hmm. uh, except in the big cities. And of course, there's a whole lot of eucalyptus and. As a Southern Californian, I'm used to thinking of eucalyptus as a Southern Californian tree because it was everywhere when I was a kid. But oh, okay. of course, it is an Australian tree mm-hmm. uh, to begin with, and was imported to California. So when I got to Australia, it, it looked very homey to me. Mm-hmm. I, I had no idea there was any eucalyptus in California. <laughs> well, they they imported it big time through the um, um, 1920s, I would say, uh, or even in the 19th century, mm-hmm. it grows really well anywhere uh, in a Mediterranean climate, and Southern California in particular, but all of California has a somewhat of a Mediterranean climate. Mm-hmm. So, And once the eucalyptus get in there, they're very self-protective. They kind of poison the ground underneath them so that nothing mm-hmm. else will grow, and mm-hmm. um, they have that distinctive smell. And, and where I grew up in, in Orange County, um, when, back in the days when there were orange uh, or orange groves and lemon groves and avocado uh, orchards, then really big eucalyptus trees were planted to be windbreaks. Uh, they grew really fast. They grew really tall, like maybe 200 feet tall. Mm-hmm. And then when the Santa Ana winds would come, instead of knocking down the orange trees, and, and uh, they would, the wind would be baffled by these really tall lines of, of uh, eucalyptus tree. Mm-hmm. Now mostly gone, but they were beautiful while they lasted. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot of times people talk about uh, when uh, a new plant or animal is introduced in an area where it's never been before, that it sometimes becomes a problem. Was it... Uh... Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, that's, that's uh, I mean, it's a little bit less intense when you've got something like trees, because they don't have that weed aspect, and they, and they don't uh, move around and reproduce like animals or kill other animals. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, eucalyptus is not a, a noxious, invasive species. Mm. Um, but it is, uh, it burns like crazy. They're like little torches when they catch fire. Mm. And so um, they, and they don't make a good railroad ties, which they discovered only after they planted giant forest of them on the land that became UC San Diego. Mm-hmm. Th- that's where I went to school. So part of my relationship with uh, eucalyptus in Australia has to do that I spent uh, nearly 10 years of my life in an eucalyptus forest where the trees are <laughs> perfectly ranked. Rank files and diagonals are all planted perfectly. And and then they suddenly discovered that they couldn't uh, cut these trees down and make railroad ties out of them because the wood uh, splinters and breaks in a weird way. Mm. Mm-hmm. So UCSD is a is a gorgeous campus and is you know dominated by uh, this eucalyptus forest which we used to mm-hmm. wander about when we were kids going to college and we'd go out in the forest and wander around at night and mm-hmm. it would be beautiful and spooky and and, and a lot mm-hmm. of fun. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a suburb and there was a forest preserve between the two two of the towns along a river and. We loved to go and play in the forest. It was like a big treat because it was like a, almost like an alien environment, really. Yeah, I think there's something very deep about it. People get back there, mm-hmm. and they and it's kind of home ground for big parts of our brains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, and completely different topic, just a, a, I guess just under two weeks ago, on January 17, you did a personal appearance inside Second Life, and so of course I'm anxious to ask you. Uh, a number of questions about it. For example, just as a general thing, what was your overall impression of the event and and maybe what surprised you about it the most? Um, I enjoyed it. I was um, frustrated by um, physical details that were a complete coincidence. that had nothing to do with Second Life. My main computer at my house I've used for so long that the keyboard is getting a little bulky. Mm-hmm. So when you really try to type fast on it, you find that there are sticky keys and you begin to make typos that you wouldn't have made if you had a, a, a fully functioning keyboard. So mm-hmm. in Second Life, one thing for sure, you got to type fast if you're going to keep up with the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I was typing fast and I was, I was finding myself bogged down by my own keyboard problems. So that's not really relevant, but it did interfere with my full enjoyment because I think what happened was 
there were about 60 people in the room, as uh, I was told later, and uh, a lot of them had things to say. And it appears there's a line of script in the lower left that is rising. Mm -hmm. So you're reading what people are saying and maybe trying to attempt to respond to them, but uh, other people don't know you're responding, and so it's just a flood of input. Mm. And I had to pick out things I might want to respond to, try to respond, hit the send key so that it was I was my words were in there. And in the meantime, five or six other lines would have gone up and sometimes disappeared before I had a chance to read them fully. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the conversation was faster than the speed at which I could uh, read it and respond at the same time, at least for the first half hour of the uh, two hours. Mm -hmm. So um, that was uh, a hard, to, a little confusing and frustrating and hard to know exactly, you know, how to choose who to respond to since many of the 60 people were talking to me, but not everybody. Some people were having side conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've tried following up myself, and it's very complicated. Yeah, it's like being in a, um, a cocktail party. It reminded me of a science fiction Writers of America cocktail party, like at the Nebulas or at, at one of the, the World Con or something like that, mm -hmm. where you've got a, a whole lot of interesting people in a room, and, you, and, and then the difference being that you can kind of hear what everybody's saying rather than there being a background noise. I mean, we're really good at filtering so that if you're in a room and conversations are everywhere and you're, you can hear the person you're talking to pretty well, and then you just let everything else blur out. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, you could hear you could hear everything because it was up on the signboard of uh, print, and that made it harder for me to focus on who I was really talking to. Mm -hmm. The room was quite beautiful. Um, soft steam tag has this uh, extropia. Uh, room and um, it, so it was this. Uh, my computer screen was filled up with this the kind of spacey image of a um, futuristic room or lecture hall, and then um, the names that uh, the people give themselves in Second Life. When you gather together 60 of them, it's really quite an exotic display of names. You know, like way over the top. You you could never get away with a cast of characters named like that. In <laughs> <laughs> in a novel, for instance, it would be too extravagant and distracting. Mm -hmm. But as a group of people gathered, it was a lot of fun just to read all the names. And I could see the little avatars, but I didn't have a great um, big screen to see. So, And, and also, I was, had to focus so hard on what people were saying, mm -hmm. this quick-scrolling thing of, of print, that I, I didn't... Um, I couldn't take advantage of the visual treat involved, mm -hmm. but, I, but I did enjoy all the names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I marvel really over that anybody can handle all that uh, script because, I mean, when, I'm, when I go, and I've been to, I guess I've seen five authors now, at least five mm -hmm. authors, and, and some other people as well, do this. And usually I'm photographing, I'm taking pictures. In fact, mm -hmm. I've put up a number of pictures of your event online. And so I'm not, I don't have a chance to read it at all, but I really marvel that anybody can hold a conversation or not a conversation, respond, I guess you'd say, to the different questions and comments that the audience throws up because they're just so fast. There's so much. Yeah, I, I eventually began to go to a protocol of, of looking for someone who had made a comment that made it clear that they were, A, interested in a response from me because mm -hmm. it's not at all true that all the comments want a response. Mm -hmm. And then B, that the question had to do with, uh, it came from someone who had clearly read my work and had been thinking about it. They were mentioning characters or or themes or plot lines or things that had happened in my book. Mm -hmm. So I felt, a, I felt an obligation, really, um, uh, to try to answer those questions because those people had come to the event really to ask me those questions and not just to chat with old friends. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of side conversations going on where those people could have had that conversation anywhere. So uh, they were, they were um, wrecking the flow of the thing as an interview. But on the other hand, it, it seemed to me that maybe there was more than one thing going on there. So that was all right. Mm -hmm. But what I did was when I identified one of those questions, then I would necessarily miss like the next two or three comments because I would be tapping out my reply. Mm -hmm. And then I would pop it out and I would usually try to put the name of the person who, who had asked the question so that they could at least see that they had been responded to. Mm -hmm. So I, I went forward on that basis and I, I missed a lot, but I, I did what I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after a while, I, I would imagine you have, to, you have to sort of cherry pick a little bit. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You chose to have your avatar in the form of a coyote, and I understand that's uh, significant uh, from your writing. Uh, what uh, what is the significance of that? 
Well, in the Mars books, uh, the character that eventually gets named Coyote is a, um, a stowaway on the first trip to Mars, the first big trip where they're sending 100 people. And it turns out there was 101 people. And that becomes clear right in the beginning of Red Mars. And then he becomes an ongoing character, somewhat like the uh, Native American coyote figure, um, elusive and always uh, trouble, mm-hmm. um, um, a kind of an anarchist, but not, I, I would say, he's actually a, an ordinary person from the Caribbean and and a, quite a canny political actor, so he's not truly an anarchist, but he is uh, a little anarchic mm-hmm. and, and constantly helping the Mars Underground to establish this alternative um, society that, that gets to uh, un, sort of works under the radar through green Mars and then somewhat takes over in blue Mars. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to say, in terms of that avatar, the coyote avatar looks pretty much like a dog. And so I was making jokes throughout the whole second life that um, my family and I were more cat people than dog people. And that I, <laughs> if I had to do it over again, I would try to be maybe a leopard or uh, some a bobcat or uh, some uh, feline rather than canine character because it ended up being looking like I was just a dog out there. Oh, okay, okay. If you ever decide that you want to redo it, I'm sure they'd be happy to have you back. Oh, yes. This was a suggestion of, uh, uh, of Sauce, and, and I, th- I went with it without thinking too deeply about how small these avatars are and what it might look like. And mm-hmm. um, it, It's not important enough to matter, and, and I like the symbol of the coyote um, if, if it had been clear that that's what it was. Had you ever been in Second Life before? No. Did they kind of hold your hand a little bit, kind of yeah. give you maybe a little primer uh, on how to maneuver and stuff? Yeah, uh-huh. I, I got into – actually, I shouldn't say that. I had been in Second Life before, like two or three days before, so that mm-hmm. I got on uh, so that Soft could run me through the um, – uh, the protocols and the, and what the methods of doing things and make sure that everything mm-hmm. worked. And in fact, the first time I went in, uh, everything didn't work, and we weren't sure if it was a Macintosh problem or what. And then without us really doing anything to change things, the next time I went in, things did work. So, yeah, I had a test run, but this was my first time in. For anybody that's uh, unfamiliar with her, with her uh, SOF is Sofrosyne Stunvog, the host of the of the discussion group, uh, yeah. Sofrosyne's Saturday Salon. Uh, which was uh, which was the event you went to? David Brin mentioned that, or no, it was Robert J. Sawyer mentioned to me one time that uh, I think he said he would fly up into the sky just when he was just trying to turn around inside Second Life. Sometimes <laughs> it was actually difficult to control the avatar using the keyboard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I didn't feel like I was fully in control of all that. That it, clearly it would take some practice, but I I could see how uh, things were responding pretty well. I mean. When the coyote jumped, he would he would kind of float in the air for a while before slowly coming back down. So it was like a low G environment, mm-hmm. but um, it was fully entertaining, mm-hmm. and I I enjoyed the visit. And the, the the unfortunately, about three days later, I was uh, invited to join a Second Life um, seminar, where a lot of people are using Second Life. Scientists and human um, university people are using it as a kind of virtual seminar room to meet when they don't are in different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is no surprise to you, but to me it was news that uh, Second Life is being used just as a, a, a meeting place for people who want to chat mm-hmm. um, in all kinds of contexts, including academic. And unfortunately, this is a day when I was prepping for a flight to Boston, and so I wasn't able to carve the time out to go check out this seminar. But you can do moder- you, you can moderate these discussions and avoid that uh, kind of overflow problem that I experienced um, by setting rules or else even just filtering questions. I don't, I don't know the details of it, but you can make the conversation slow down to the speed where everybody gets responded to, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which in certain contexts is what you want. If you're at a cocktail party, which is sort of what I felt I was like, then that, that isn't, wasn't really the point. Yeah, um, NASA has done some uh, lecture series and stuff like that that I've been to, a few of them. They usually use voice, though, so that you don't have to you know, read a lot of text. You can just listen. Yes. Yeah. I, I think in, uh, that, that has some obvious huge advantages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's an area that I wanted to ask you about that's it's related to this. Some transhumanists, uh, they, their ideal future is, that, uh, is to have their the complete content of their mind uploaded into a vast computer so that they can abandon the, uh, the imperfect physical world and live entirely 
in a virtual world. Of course, it would be a better virtual world than, than you were in the other day. Well, in fact, they expect it to be indistinguishable from the physical world uh, by the time it's possible, technologically possible, to upload their minds to that kind of world. Is that something that you think you might be, if even if only temporarily lured into, uh, to visiting or even or even living in? No, no, and it strikes me that it's another one of these um, fantasias that um, springs out of the science fictional um, way of thinking that any small advance in the sciences is taken as um, proof that you could do a straight line extrapolation out to some further um, advance that is uh, uh, guaranteed somehow by the initial advance. Mm-hmm. So that all improvement, you would just lay a ruler down on a graph and, and draw it on out and be confident that at a cer- after a certain amount of time passed that you'd get to the other point on the ruler that you'd marked out in a straight line. Well, it just isn't that way. Mm-hmm. There, and in fact, this very a commonplace of, of Moore's law, supposedly, that trans- transistors will get half the size every 18 months for forever is is one of these mistakes um and and it's a little jokey thing that i think people know is wrong but they say it anyway mm-hmm. you come to a point where you can't continue to make improvements at the same speed and so and all human progress and and technological abilities move in in kind of big s curves there's plateaus where we we hit where we can't make any further improvement because it's physically impossible or it's because it's beyond our skills one or the other and so you get this uh, strange, uh, and sometimes there's also asymptotic approach to a non-reachable um, uh, ideal. And and so that being the case, I think when looking at that situation, those folks are misunderstanding um, human intelligence, the ability to, um, com- what computers are. The whole interface there is a, is a, is a mass of bad understanding of, of the, the component parts. So that we're not going to be able to download or, or upload our minds into uh, big computers, not possible. Um, they're they're not understanding the um, a the sheer quantitative size of the synaptic components of the brain, which are, are huge and 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 w- run way up into the trillions. But b also the organizing principles by which those component parts connect with each other and operate are unknown and not findable because we can't. We don't have uh, tools of uh, uh, huge enough discernment, of, of powerful enough discernment to be able to see the brain while it's running. And vivisection or uh, autopsies are not going to be able to tell us. Whereas at the same time, if you have working living brains, you can't get inside enough, far enough into them to see the detail workings well enough to understand them. These outside scans that we're doing are... are suggestive of certain things, but they don't get into the fine structure detail. So, and, and also it's been plausibly suggested that the stuff going on in the brain is happening at, at such a speed and at such small uh, levels that we're seeing quantum mechanical effects. The, the results of quantum mechanics are, uh, effects are part of consciousness and intelligence. All those things combined uh, to a situation where we're never going to fully understand how human brains work, and and double damned, we're never going to be able to create a model of it in a mechanical system that we've built. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's another one of these fantasies. Like, say you manage to shoot a chemical rocket off into space, and the very next thing you're saying, well, we're going to be able to control the whole galaxy and, and colonize the whole galaxy. Well, that's a very common science fiction scenario out of the 1930s and 1940s, 1950s, mm-hmm. and yet and now it becomes clear that we're not going to be able to do that, that really the galaxy is way too big and our ability to get around in space is way too limited. And It was a fantasia. Mm. Well, this uploading of human minds into computers is another fantasia, like humans controlling the whole galaxy. It comes from the same sort of mental uh, error. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that science, uh, as we understand it, the scientific method will continue to be used for centuries, hundreds of thousands of years? Do you think human beings are going to continue to exist that far into the future? I hope so. I think it's a, it, it would be entirely possible. Those are not long numbers. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, the, the standard lifetime of a species um, on Earth has been about 10 million years, and then 
that's an average. And of course, we know of things like sharks or cockroaches that have been around for more like 300 million years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so species stability, uh, you would have to postulate that intelligence was a, a kind of an evolutionary accident and that we it made us somehow suicidal or incompetent mm-hmm. uh, to say that human beings would only be here for, I mean, right now we're talking about uh, the, our particular species, we're talking about less than 200,000 years old. And so uh, unless we spectacularly destroy ourselves early, which we very well might do, um, the expectation is that we would survive. And, and the scientific method is, is a, a kind of a formalization of a survival technique that is really um, a, a powerful. I mean, it's got us where we are now. Um, this this comparison and all the me- parts of the scientific method, but a spe- what you could bring it down to a kind of reality principle of paying attention to reality, doing things, seeing what we do, and trying to rate how we do on some kind of survival success scale, and then changing what we do afterwards. I mean, this is a gross simplification of the scientific method, but you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's just a, 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 a scientific method is a is a highly fine-tuned survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. So uh, if humans survive at all, it will be because they are employing the scientific method. Because it could be be postulated that the 6 billion people we have on Earth here is kind of unsustainably high, that the Earth can't really support 6 billion human beings, uh, especially living at Western or uh, advanced nation lifestyles, that you would need more like 3 or 4 or 5 Earths to support uh, uh, six billion humans at Western lifestyles, so something's got to give. The lifestyle, or the numbers, or, or the technology involved, things have to be um, adjusted. And it may be that one of the adjustments is that we s- settle out at a, a sustainable pop- world population of more like you know three billion. I mean, it's impossible to say right now what the sustainable number of humans on the planet might be, but. It's at least possible that we're living in a kind of an oil bubble or a carbon bubble, where we burning by burning all the carbon, uh, by the, burning all the fossil carbon, we have um, uh, set up a what looks like a sustainability for six billion. But when we run out of the fossil carbon, it might not be be true anymore because the fossil carbon is also fertilizer as well as um, you know energy power. And so our food as well as our mobility is dependent on these fossil carbons. So we need to transfer away from them. And when we do, we might find that we're, there's there's um, fuel for fewer people than, than there are alive now. When would you expect us to learn that? In 10 years, 30, 50 years, mm, when we burn through all this? Longer, longer, yeah. Um, we uh, not for ten, sure, ten years, not not at all. Um, we, we won't we won't have any idea. Um, I uh, what I've been looking at is the way that the population stabilizes when there's social justice, and so this brings in a whole different realm of thought. And yet, what you see in the record is that in the countries where uh, women and children have full political rights, property rights, personal rights. Uh, and it, it really comes down to uh, women because of the the mom factor that it, it, that no matter what you need moms for babies, and um, if when they have a full set of of human rights in this world and are citizens just like uh, men and anybody else, then they choose to only have a couple kids over the course of their life mm-hmm. because it's too much of a hassle to have more. Now this is of course just an average statement. And there are some who get really fond of it, and it's the greatest part of their life, and so they have more than two kids because parenting becomes the thing that they like to do. But on the other hand, there are some that have no kids whatsoever because they don't have time for it and their careers mean more to them and it's not of interest to them. Mm -hmm. And what you find in the advanced countries is the average is right about replacement rate, or even they worry about this in places like Japan and in Northern Europe, a a little bit under replacement rate Mm -hmm. so that you've got a slightly shrinking population in, in countries where women have most power over their own lives. Well, if that were to be a worldwide condition, then you wouldn't have this problem of something like you know, 70 to 80 million more people every year, year in and year out, in, in terms of the world population. And that would be a really good thing for our long-term survivability. Um, we, need, we need population stabilization, and it may be that um, if we get to slightly under-replacement rate, and over the course of the next two, three hundred years, 
we get a, a world where there is a, a uniform um, social justice, and and every family is at a, and every country is at about the replacement rate, but it had been under, then without starvation or a crisis or a complete catastrophe or any of our science fiction apocalyptic scenarios, you still could get down to a decent working human population of stability and 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 prosperity of you know who knows three four or five billion. Um, the Earth might sustain that with a really good, clean tech. Mm -hmm. The other kind of wild card on population, though, is that there's a lot of work on human longevity, traditional medicine working in that area, and also people who are working specifically to, to the idea of very long human lives. Some people are against the idea of people living, say, indefinitely, because uh, it's not traditional. Death has always been with us, and, that it should, uh, and th so it should remain simply because it's traditional. <laughs> I have a tendency to be anti-death. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I see my parents there in their 70s, and I don't want them to die. I don't my siblings to die. I've seen several of my cousins die already, and, and they were still pretty young. Yeah. But, of course, if if humans do become to reach a point where we live indefinitely, at least in the developed portions of the world, that would kind of throw a monkey wrench into the population situation, wouldn't it? Sure, that. But let's let's just uh, uh, I mean it's like creating a problem that doesn't exist. Um, the uh, I, I'm totally in favor of longevity. I think um, um, medical care is one of the greatest, uh, one of the main points of science, and it's what we do. Um, it, it's a reduction of suffering. It's it's an expansion of human potential, of of self actualization, and. Uh, just making a full human life, the less pain, misery, and illness and death there is, the more human life there is. So you can't help but love that. And so once again, though, it's a fantasia to start talking about living indefinitely. Um, it, aging is, is very, very natural. Um, it's, it's kind of a miracle that we last as long as we do when you look at how many complex systems have to work for us to stay alive. And so I can I can well imagine, and I think we will keep chipping away at, at mortality, and that uh, uh, lifetime average lifetimes will creep up, and it may be even that there's not an upper end to it. That if you could stabilize the system, and really know what you were up to, that you could get a, a super powerful medical technologies that have people live in quite a long time, and and then presumably some accident would get them or some crash of the system that hadn't been predicted. I, I mean, I flatly disbelieve in the immortality, and so I think that it's more a matter of longevity. And I've written about this many times in my fiction. And, uh, and you do, you develop a demographic problem for sure, and that's where you would have to think about um, uh, it makes sense to, to maybe live uh, on all of the livable surfaces in the solar system, for instance. Uh, it makes sense also at that point to think that having children would be special and unusual, that you would want to have it at replacement rate. And so people would still be dying. Um, there's no, we're so biological that there's no avoiding that. Um, and and you could once again get the stability. Say that the, the best of our medical tech could do to get people up and in somewhere into, um, I've written about this, that we were living like five or 600 years, and then some accident or some, some uh, unexpected crash would get you. And so there would be people dying, and then there would be people being born, and you could establish demographic stability once again on that basis. So the whole thing is handleable, in mm -hmm. other words, mm -hmm. and fully desirable. I'm, I'm totally with you. There's no reason to say that just because, you know, lifetimes have been traditionally our, you know, what is it, a three score and ten, uh, that we shouldn't push as hard as ever we could to lengthen that out. Mm -hmm. Some people talk about what they call uh, they call it uh, liftoff. That is to say, for example, I'm 53 right now, and if I live, say, 30 more years, because medicine was able mm -hmm. to keep me alive till into my 80s, then by in those 30 years they would develop new and better techniques to keep me alive even longer. Mm -hmm. In which case I might make it to 100. In which case they would develop even more techniques, and eventually they would actually the technology would outrun my my lifespan. So, <laughs> Well, I'm 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 56, and uh, I'm totally with you on all that. But um, my impression is that, alas, the medical advances will come uh, a slightly slower for us. Um, 
There's an absolutely beautiful short story by Robert Silverberg called The Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn, where uh, a, a man reflects, looking at the young people in his time, that he's just too late. He, he's, he's just too old to be uh, assured of, of, being, of, of getting this, uh, this longevity um, uh, liftoff. And the young people he's looked around at are, going, are just young enough that they're going to be able to take advantage of the uh, liftoff so that one of one group of the population alive at the same time, the older ones are going through the gate of horn into the world of death, and the, the younger ones will be going through the gate of ivory into a, a world of, of way extended longevity. And, um, you know, we might be in that world. Silverberg is a very uh, sharp and deep thinker, and uh, he may have perceived something real. Uh, and my very strong impression is that we're on the wrong side of that divide. And <laughs> but I, I, we may I also think that the, the two-year-olds alive today, sadly, um, I think are also still on the wrong side of that divide. That um, oh, okay. I, I don't think this, this uh, liftoff is uh, – we're just chipping away at um, aging problems, and it turns out to be super complex, and, and we're not going to find a single uh, silver bullet that suddenly cures aging, I don't believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I, yeah. A lot of times these kind of things come as surprises. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like about every decade, at least in the past, I don't know about the future, but previously, about every decade there seems to be two, one or two really revolutionary innovations. I remember there was the, the laser came out and nobody anticipated it. And then there was the, the transistor. Nobody seemed to have anticipated that. And they sort of launch into a whole new field of, of, uh, of development. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're unanticipatable in advance, apparently. Well, I I just I have some friends in the biomedical community, and they're putting their whole careers into just uh, learning one tiny little part of a system. That when you look at the genome, when you look at the um, the way that genes are expressed into uh, proteins, mm-hmm. when you look at the um, uh, not just the, the the genome, but the proteome, the the list of potential proteins, and how you look at a, a diagram of any one given protein, mm-hmm. with all its folds or a messenger RNA, um, and you and you go into the details of the processes that are involved in um, in biological creatures staying alive, even at the level of the fruit fly. Well, it's just mind-boggling. It mm. it it's a um, it, it is complex beyond uh, description and beyond the comprehension of any one given human being so that you can't point to any person on this earth that can say confidently they, that they know everything that we know about how human bodies operate. It, it's a distributed system where uh, any one given expert just knows one less than 1% of the total knowledge involved. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're lo- talking about a communal effort of the entire species to understand itself, and um, and and the, and like I said, we can't understand the inside of the brain. So what if uh, we manage to solve all other aging problems, but um, some of them turn out to be internal in the brain, little clocks, little little um, um, biological uh, markers, chronomarkers. I mean, there are certain parts of our bodies that once they are born, they begin an aging process that just runs straight on downhill into disuse and dysfunction. Um, and and there's apoptosis. There's you know a programmed cell death that needs to happen for us to live. I mean it is just a mess of conflicting competing systems. The miracle is that we're alive and walking at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to keep that all thing going is like to the I don't you may be I guess you are perhaps old enough to remember the Ed Sullivan show where there would be oh, the yeah. act of the people who would spin plates on top of poles. Mm-hmm. And they would be running around spinning those plates on top of the poles, and it was wonderful to see they would get a dozen or so uh, plates spinning on top of poles, an acrobatic act. It was silly, but it was funny. Mm-hmm. Well, you got to imagine that there's some, you know, uh, half million plates spinning on top of poles, and all of them have to be spinning, and some, some there's some process of some person running around spinning all those, and that's what's keeping us alive. And if any of the plates go, then the whole system begins to crash. Mm-hmm. And that's life on this earth. That's biological systems. So longevity is going to be a, a tough, tough nut to crack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. Let me ask you about uh, robots. I don't know, have you uh, have you been following the developments in robots, uh, robotics lately? 
Well, not the new developments, no. Okay, there's several areas that I'd like to ask your, your opinion on, and one is I've been thinking of buying one of those robot vacuum cleaners, the Roomba. Have you seen mm. those? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, those look pretty cool. They do. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Also, uh, there's a, a new book out that just came out a few months ago, uh, completely unrelated to the Roomba, of course. It's about uh, that in the future, people will fall in love and marry robots. Have you heard about this one? Mm, no. Oh, okay. It's Although a, it's not a, I mean, it's not a new idea in science fiction, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this guy was putting out the book as a as something that's actually going to happen, and um, concurrently, unrelated though, there was a um, a video ad online a few months ago for a robot that was dubbed as the perfect woman. It was a fake though. This was just a woman pretending mm. to be a robot. Mm. <laughs> And supposedly it was a French outfit that was going to be offering her for sale uh, to men who are lonely and need someone to cook and clean. I mean, they were presenting it as a real robot. Mm. But you could tell by looking at the video that it was actually a woman, you know, just sort of moving a little stiff and stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't heard any any prosecution of that yet. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good joke. I mean, it's kind of a Stepford wife thing. So I'm... Yeah. Well, yeah. this is all a, a bad category error. I mean, it, I suppose that you could maybe run up a robot that would be the equivalent of a of a about a dog level of um, companionship. But the, even dogs have consciousness, and you, people fall in love with their dogs as as companions and reduce the loneliness because because precisely because you know you have a consciousness there, a mm. sentience, and that sentience may be simpler. But it's still pretty complex, and it's got its its uh, ways, yeah. its its uh, instincts that are species wide, and also its individuality to its own character, and um, and th- all this is stuff that, that robotics can't do, and th- and this is another one of these bad category errors of which uh, you know the science fiction community is stuffed with them, but I think it's just representative of humanity uh, as a whole, and our relationship to our technology is not is not fully uh, understood by a lot of people. And so um, uh, the problem is that when you know it's a robot, then um, you'd be constantly on the hunt for some kind of sentience and some kind of artificial intelligence. But I think you'd constantly be let down mm-hmm. that that the knowledge that you've just got a, a construct there that doesn't have consciousness would be the kicker that means that it's never fully satisfying because companionship is a matter of uh, of uh, relating to other consciousness mm-hmm. and and the surprises involved and the rewards involved uh, the notion that some other consciousness has regard for you is is a, an interactive quality and and uh, so it's irreplaceable and because I'm not a big believer in strong AI as I think we've talked about before on your program um mm-hmm. Uh, then that's just the you know the guts of the machine. That's where the the brain of a robot or the interest of it, it, it falls apart because I don't believe you're going to get anything remotely like human consciousness out of those things. Yeah, there was a doll uh, I guess about five or ten years ago. Wasn't it called like Teddy Rustin or something? It would read stories to children. I think it was a little stuffed animal of some sort, sort of a semi-robot. But of course, like you say the children wouldn't relate to it like a person because there's no mind there. There's no, you can't really interact and discover more about the personality. Right. And, you know, I know from myself and my own family life that what a child is enjoying when being read to by a parent in particular is not just the story, although that's important, but it could, notice it could be any story and it would still be satisfactory because it's the action of the interaction. Mm-hmm. It, that it's time when the parent, busy parent, is suddenly uh, devoting to paying attention to a, um, a, a full interaction with the kid. Mm-hmm. So you know, you set the kid down, and you've got some robot reading a story aloud. That's almost just like turning on a tape recorder. I mean, what's the point? It, mm-hmm. it, it, the really important part of the interaction has been missed. Mm-hmm. In fact, in that doll, it was a tape. It was a cassette tape. But it also involved, or it included some kind of like movements, control for the movements of the doll too. But it was basically just a tape. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about, I don't know if you've noticed that uh, there's a lot of TV now that's online, like in Hulu and TV Land, they're offering a lot of TV shows. Have you, uh, have you ever watched any online TV? No, I haven't. 
I mean, I was never a big TV watcher in the first place, and now I'm not much of an online user. So this is oh, all, really no. okay. I would have thought you'd be all over the uh, all over the internet. No, I, I'm not really. I mean, the the thing is that being a writer, I have to spend an awful lot of time facing the keyboard and uh, the laptop screen or the computer screen. Oh. So, okay, I finish my day's work and I've got choices as to what I want to do. I mean, really low on the list is sitting there staring at that screen. <laughs> I've already done that. So i got chores to do. i got people to interact with. i got um, the um, child of ours that's still living at home. I've got my garden. I've got my running routine. Um, and I'm often listening to music whilst I, I, I run. And um, I've got various sports that I do. I've got books to read. And, I, and if you're going to read, it's a lot easier on the eyes and the body to read a book than to read a a computer screen. Mm -hmm. Now, all that being said, the internet has blossomed wonderfully, and it is a stupendous research tool now, um, uh, quick and pretty damned accurate and, and pretty uh, full, mm -hmm. so that um, it, it makes a damn good encyclopedia. And it probably makes, and, and, and it makes an encyclopedia also of, of video clips, mm -hmm. so that it isn't just words, but uh, visual images, which is obvious when you go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, it's a great thing. I'm not saying it's not a great thing, but I am definitely saying that I'm not into it. Mm. I, I, I use it when I have to, but it's not my recreational space. Oh, okay. By the way, I noticed that you're going to be an instructor at uh, the Clarion Workshop in uh, 2009. Have you, uh, yep. have you taught Clarion before? I have once before in mm -hmm. 1988. Oh, okay. Well, it's been a while then. <laughs> <laughs> 21 years between gigs. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, what was your experience with it? But I guess it's changed a bit since oh, then. Oh, no, I think it's very much the same. Oh, really? Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a deliberate policy on the part of the Clarion Instructor core or oh, okay. um, brain trust. Mm -hmm. um, it's felt that it works, that the method that was worked out by uh, Damon Knight and Kit Wilhelm and Robin Scott Wilson and and uh, other writers of that time putting together the Milford um, Writers Conference as well as the Clarion um, Workshop, mm -hmm. they feel they've got a method that's worked and, and it's been kept the same ever since. Mm. For those uh, unfamiliar with it, uh, how, would you, uh, how would you describe it? Um, the, the way Clarion works is that it's six weeks long in the summertime and these days is it's at University of California, San Diego, which is a really nice place to spend six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, in the summer or the winter, and you you gather with uh, 18 other students, and then each week a new writer comes in and is in, is the instructor for that week, mm. and there'll be a local administrator that keeps continuity going, a director that knows all the students and and introduces the writers and vice versa. But the the new writer comes in, well, they've got completely different ideas about fiction, about what works and what doesn't work. And so what's interesting as you go through this, and I was a student at Clarion even longer ago in 1975, mm -hmm. so I saw this work myself as a student, is that yeah, all the writers are individually impressive, but when you have all of them, you've gone through all of them, you you become aware that there are many different ways to approach writing and uh, and be successful at it so that you can begin to think, well, what do I want? And you realize there's no, there are no hard and fast rules to speak of. There are just different methods. Mm -hmm. So what happens, though, is that the students are writing stories and trying to get stories done. And then when they finish them, um, in the old days, you know, 20 print copies would be immediately produced. These days it just gets thrown online. Mm -hmm. The other students and the instructor will read the stories that are turned in, and a, and a sequence is set up where when they meet in the morning, and the workshop will run from 9 a.m. to noon, uh, they all settle into the room. Everybody has to be there. There's no skip in class because this is important, and everybody's agreed and volunteered to be there. Mm -hmm. um, get in there in the workshop room. The story is uh, introduced, and then everybody comments on it for like two minutes. Goes around the room. Everybody says what they think is important in their response and what they would suggest be done better, and things they like, things they didn't like. It gets around to the instructor. The instructor will sometimes go on a, more than a two minutes, go on four minutes, and mm -hmm. then the, the writer of the story can either respond or not. That sort of depends on the workshop group and what they feel is appropriate. I mean, when I was a student, we all said, you know what? Out in the world, you never get to respond to your critics. Mm -hmm. So why should you at Clarion? Other groups have felt that that is part of the ongoing educational process is to be able to talk about it a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And so then the discussion being done, and that will have taken 
most of an hour, they go on to another story. So the, the whole method is intensive workshopping of individual stories and talking about specifics. It's not lectures about generalities, because there are no generalities, really, mm-hmm. that obtain all the way across the board. What there is is a kind of situational system of, well, this works in this context, and that doesn't work in this context. And you have to talk about specifics, and so people's stories serve as the specifics. Mm-hmm. And my friend Karen Fowler has been saying to me for years that it's not what people say about your stories that helps you at Clarion, because the truth is you're going to get 18 different responses, and they might range all over the map, and you might end up totally confused about mm-hmm. what people have said about that story, and you have to kind of sort things out, well, what you believe and what you don't believe. Mm-hmm. But what's, what Karen says, what you learn from is figuring out useful things to say to other people about their stories. <laughs> and as you become a better critic over the course of Clarion of other people's work, you then can turn that on your own work, later on and you can become a better critic of your own work you know what you're looking for you know what kind of responses you can get Mm -hmm. and as she's saying it makes you into a better reader rather than a better writer and then as a better reader you become a better writer so this has been reassuring to me because i've not ever been totally convinced that the method is is uh, as much as it as it's cracked up to be in terms of usefulness but Mm -hmm. i think she's right about that you do become a better reader after crying and that that's automatically helpful. I was in a writer's group one time uh, back when the internet was still kind of new, I guess, at least to me. Uh, it was around 91, 92. Mm-hmm. And um, I wasn't getting very good critiques of my story. That is, they weren't very analytical or whatever you want to say. But I was in, I was doing critiques of other people's stories, and I learned a lot from doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Karen, is a, she's done a lot of workshops, and she's a super smart writer, and so I think she's basically figured out what's going on here. Mm-hmm. And it's helped me to be more positive about the whole um, workshop experience than I was before then, and that's one of the reasons I think that I've agreed to teach again. And, mm-hmm. um, the other reason being that I was a UCSD graduate myself, and when Clarion had to move, when Michigan State basically kicked it out and it had no home, then I helped it to get relocated to UC San Diego, and so now I'm I'm involved ah, uh, from both ends, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and so I'm kind of the liaison mm-hmm. uh, figure at least at this point, and so I'm I, I need to be involved. Mm-hmm. Well, my suspicion is that even if you don't stand up there and say you know something brilliant, which you probably will anyway, but even if you don't, people will be thinking to themselves, "My word, I, you know, I, I, Kim Stanley Robinson is here. I have to write my very best." <laughs> So, well, that's, if, thank you for that. It'll be a motivator, if nothing else. Well, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, teaching crowd every year, and, um, mm-hmm. and and I do think that people see the list of instructors and they say, oh, that would be real useful because I like that writer's work, and so it inspires some people to go. I mean, we've been amortizing the Clarion Workshop for this summer on uh, Google Ads, and you get a little bit of feedback there as to who has responded to your ads and who's inquired, etc., in terms of what worlds they come out of. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a certain surge this year out of the science and engineering community, mm. which I, I am pleased to see and which I suspect has to, uh, to do with me being included on the list of instructors because mm-hmm. there are uh, very few science fiction writers who have... Um, done more to try to dive into the guts of the actual sciences as they exist right now mm-hmm. uh, than I have. And, and I say that uh, with a little bit of dismay because it seems to me, A, that it's been a, a painful for me to try to do it because it's hard, and B, I'd like to read more science fiction like that because it's interesting. Mm-hmm. So that I wish there were more science fiction writers doing that kind of work. And I know that they're out there, but um, I know also that there's a whole lot of of, of so-called science fiction that doesn't really ever talk about the real sciences at all. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so I, I begin to look weird in what I do when actually I think what I'm doing is what ought to be done or, or should be done more. Mm-hmm. Well, I sure appreciate you taking the time for the interview. You betcha. That was Kim Stanley Robinson. That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, 
copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. Offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish, up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen, and is from his album Big Bad Son, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com that's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain be it the near future or the far future you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com that's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important, but if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. To get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends, because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. Interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.